even with the Huskies down in three to nothing, I still watch because we are an Easter people. We are a hopeful people. You never know. The Easter story, our story, was a story of against all odds. On that first Easter, every last one of Jesus' closest followers found themselves saying, Jesus? Alive? No chance. They saw him beaten, hung on the cross. His mother weep. It was over. The empire won again. They went to anoint a dead body because when someone dies, they're dead. Nobody believed the women at the tomb. The men walking to Emmaus didn't recognize him because he was dead. Their 20 minutes of fame was over. They quit believing he was the Messiah because Messiahs, they don't die. And yet, he appeared. Against all odds, the cross was not the end. Eric Urkula built us this beautiful cross. And as you go, we have it as you leave the sanctuary in the world because that's just the beginning. The cross is not the end. You may have all kinds of odds stacked up against you. Financial stress, a troubled marriage, alcoholism, you lost a child. But know this, when we think the odds are too great, there's no chance. No one will ever love me. I'll never be happy again. I've made too many mistakes. I've made too big a mess. I've been hurt too much. Dear church, my friends, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this. In Jesus, your past has no hold on you or me against all odds. You always get a second chance because in Christ, you are always being made new. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Your time as a caterpillar has exceeded. We are out and about, even in the rains, looking for worms, and underneath the leaves, the caterpillars, they are in the process. And we, as caterpillars, our time has expired, and our wings are ready for us to fly. Let us rise.
Thank you, worship fan, our worship leaders. Thank you, Judy. Starting out with that beautiful prelude, I think I am up for whatever the week may bring. It almost sounded a bit Irish, Judy, almost. with the pipe there. You use that setting anytime you'd like. Okay. <laughs> it was beautiful. We are gathered and surrounded by the saints and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, may it be with you all. Thank you. Let's try that one more time because I really need it. May it be with you all, and you respond. Also, very good Lutherans. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I mean that. I need it. In confession and forgiveness, and you grieving me in the same way. God of Easter, and you were promised that difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. Praise to you, O God of beautiful destinations. Amen. Starbucks, and I was amazed that I really 
didn't have to tell my cousin direction. He hasn't been in Duluth in years. But he understands north, south, east, and west because he's a pilot. He keeps really good track of those destinations, landmarks around. He understands, well, when we were driving, he knew that the lake was down on the hill. He knew that the sun was rising from the east. And we just kind of made a loop there. And he came out of Starbucks and he knew, all right, we're not going to go down Anderson Road, but we're going to take a right and go towards the mall. And then back to the house by Target on Stender. Made a nice little, little circle there. Whereas Abby and I, we get lost really easy, especially in the woods. But my cousin Chris, because of his vocation, he understands directions and where things are. Like my cousin, we are called to pay attention. Pay attention to the landmarks. And the landmarks are this, when it comes to the story this morning, the story that we'll hear from Nancy. The Holy Gospel according to St. John is this. The landmarks are wounds. We are called to pay attention to those who are around us. Because they are Jesus. If we see those landmarks, those wounds, if we feel them, sense them all, experience them with our neighbors, those wounds, those people who carry those wounds are Jesus. Thomas knew it was Jesus because of his wounds. Same for us. We now read. I like to read. I like to read scripture. And we read to know we're not alone. That other folks have walked the same path that we walk. And in solidarity and the saints that have gone before us, we aren't alone. And so we're not going to read in this instance. We're going to listen to Nancy. And it is my hope that you'll feel with whatever you bring this morning that you're not alone. That I'm with you. Your church is with you. And more importantly, the risen Christ walks with you. Nancy. <laughs> Thomas, put your finger here and 
see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. So Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I cannot dance for love nor money. But one of the things I've been craving most during this time is the return of concerts here in town. I always knew that when things open up again, life would look and feel different. It's just going to. But when Britain vaccine passports for entry into events like concerts, it got me thinking, who among the regulars of the music scene here in Duluth would I see there again if our country adopts the same approach? Of course, Britain is not the only country considering this kind of approach to easing out of the pandemic. And no matter the location, the method raises thorny questions. Like any other issue, how much of the rhetoric around vaccine passports is partisan noise? And where are their legitimate justifications and concerns? Passports and passes might be tickets to freedom for sure. But for others, the reality, fraught with privacy and ethical concerns, could be far less rosy. Could be. I'm looking forward to the day of more freedoms. But the alternative could also be far less rosy. Tickets to freedom? far less rosy. We get it. The far less rosy underbelly of the beast we all subsist in. And it needs to be dealt with carefully. We had a simple bag. We don't want to use plastic bags very often. And I left some food in a carry-on, carry-in bag for the grocery store and it sat there a long time and it started to mold and it made the bag quite messy. And I thought about throwing away it, then I thought, well, why don't I just soak it? And our laundry room is the top floor in our house. So I sat it down and I turned the faucet on. And the kids were off in another part of the house, and I could hear them fighting. So I turned my back, and I ran in their direction, and I left the water run. And it's the one sink in the house that doesn't have that overflow drain. And so I'm sitting in that first floor, and all of a sudden, water just starts gushing <laughs> from that ceiling and I'm wondering where is this water coming from and I quickly rush upstairs and it's already too late all that water that was pooling for probably 15 minutes in our laundry room was coming down through the ceiling and into our entryway and living room and there Abby and I stood looking at each other thinking Boy, was that an expensive carrying bag that I should have probably, 10 cents probably, I should just toss that away. And now I'm thinking, all that water has pulled, and I'm wondering, ah, what do I do? Do I need to 
punch a hole and try it out because my father-in-law was there inspecting it and he looked up, oh, yeah, he had better be careful. And now my cousin's here and he's saying the same thing. That could grow into black mold. And I'm thinking, oh, my word, we have to deal with that. That could become a health issue for Abby and I and the girls. The water damage needs to be dealt with, Noah. Or black mold will wreak havoc. I hear many people and many preachers in the church lately downplaying the idea of the black mold in our souls and the forgiveness needed for it. The idea seems to be that talking about sins is old-fashioned. People are not troubled by their sins, so it goes, so to speak, about sins. And sins are negative, and they don't deserve our attention. People want a positive religion with a positive God. This talk about the negativity of sin reminds me of a passage in John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie, in which he ducked his head into a Vermont church in the 60s and heard prayers, but also including a fire and brimstone sermon on sin. Steinbeck described, The service did my heart and I hope my soul some good. It had been long since I heard such an approach. It is our practice now, at least in the large cities, to find from our psychiatric priesthood that our sins aren't really sins at all, but accidents that are set in motion by forces beyond our control. There was no such nonsense in the church in Vermont. And there's no such nonsense, nonsense here at Holy Cross. Steinbeck concluded his reflections on the church service. For some years now, God has been a pal to us, practicing togetherness. And that causes the same emptiness a father does playing softball with his son. But this Vermont God cared enough about me to go to a lot of trouble addressing the real issues of Thomas and my own disbelief. He put my sins in a new perspective, Steinbeck wrote about that preacher in Vermont. Whereas they had been small and mean and nasty and best forgotten, this minister gave them some size and bloom and dignity. I was talking to Bill this morning, and I just love the lilies and how they've held their bloom, and they, of course, will bring more, and are blooming, perhaps, in your homes now, too. That's why we start our service with confession and forgiveness, most services. If not, then we're talking about and celebrating our gifts of baptism. There is no other way that I can put one foot in front of the other without starting my week with oath, confession, and forgiveness. Every Sunday morning, I come, yes, with a hopeful, joyful heart, but also one that also carries tremendous weight and deep, deep sin that I need to be released from. That is why I come to church. Although Steinbeck clearly has his tongue planted firmly as he narrates his church experience, he nevertheless accurately describes a Christianity without sin and forgiveness as a religion of design obsolescence. The incredible, wonderful news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was so hard to believe, even by Thomas, the one who asked to see and feel the wounds. This good news starts out as very bad news. Yes, there is something wrong with each and every one of us. We're Thomases. 
Yes, we are born into a broken world, and we ourselves are broken like Thomas. Yes, one day we all will die. And yes, every day we live in ways that separate us from God and hurt our neighbors. But we only tell this bad news because we have unfathomable, fantastic good news to share with the world. In Christ Jesus, God has defeated death. In Christ Jesus, God is overcoming all the forces that defy the creative, life-giving will of the Creator against all odds. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And as I say that to you, I say to me, Noah, your sins are forgiven. And in the ministry of the Christ, to whom Jesus gave the authority to forgive sins against all odds. Divine forgiveness is reaching every nation on earth. He is risen indeed. Texas just for a day or so. She's purchased a dental laser and it's primarily going to help the kids in the region with tongue ties and moms who are breastfeeding. But she had to go to Austin about a day or so, flew out of Duluth, and last night Sylvie stood by the, the tears 
starting to well up in Sylvie's eyes. It felt ordinary, uh, but there was beauty in that moment. I said, yeah, Sylvie, I know. She'll be home and she's gonna fly in this morning uh, to Duluth here and they'll be back together again. If we allow ourselves to be enchanted, which I was, I sat and I held her, it's okay. Mom will be home in the morning. Enchanted by the beauty of the ordinary, we begin to see all the things that are extraordinary. This is who and whose we are, and we confess it now in our story together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So here you have it. There's no perfect life, no perfect job, no perfect childhood, no perfect marriage, and no perfect set of people who will always do what we expect them to do. What we have is a perfect God, a perfect, resurrected God, who is able to lead us through this imperfect life with unfailing, around every corner, perfect forgiveness, perfect strength, incomparable wisdom, and infinite love. And it is all yours in word and sacrament. May it bring you deep peace, dear church. Now we gather our offering God's work, our hands.
my little uh, three-year-old, soon to be four-year-old, little Esme has this amazing gift. She knows if I clean up one room in the house, and she'll go right behind me and pull out whatever I picked up off the floor. It's amazing. <laughs> and so I picked up our living room and there were still Easter buckets with all the Easter tinsel. And she looked in there, she's looking for some eggs and she just started to throw the Easter tinsel everywhere. And I thought, oh man, oh my. And then I began to think about all of you. I thought, if it wasn't for all of you in this special place, Easter for Esme and Sylvie and Abby and I and all of us, all of our families and beyond, our church family, if it wasn't for you, Easter would only be about that tinsel and a few eggs and a candy. I thought, you know, that's great. We love the Easter Bunny and we support him wholeheartedly. <laughs> but if that was all that Easter was about, I'd be kind of sad. And it's not. It is oh so much more. And she gets that from all of you. And I appreciate you so much because of it. She got her little Easter bag. She got the Easter story. She colored. And we talked about the third day of Holy Week. And the goodness of Good Friday. And Easter. And we got a little Berenstein Bears book that reads. I didn't even know, but there's a Berenstein Bears book that tells the Easter story as well. Thank you for that gift. For that reason, I know that she will let her little light shine in her own special way, as do we all, this little light of ours. Junior high 
senior high students because of their generosity, their innovation, and yours as well. They are at 4000 Their goal is $6,000, and there are a few auction items left over. It's gone well, um, and now the kids have decided, look, we are going to take 50% off those remaining items, check them out. If you're not interested, of course, you can always give gifts if you haven't done so as well. For a very incredible child of God, son of this parish who has been through oh so much. We continue to root for you, Anders, and we are also there for you in a very practical way. Now, freed in the risen Christ, do more of what makes you happy. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs>